Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Julius Fredrickson. For those of you who don't know me, I am the director of the Center for the Study of Aphasia Recovery, or CSTAR, as we call it. I'm also the PI on the P50 grant that we got to support CSTAR. Um, I want to tell you really quickly about, about what CSTAR is. We now understand that aphasia therapy can be very beneficial for people with aphasia. And uh, what we're trying to figure out is what kinds of therapy works best for what kinds of aphasia. So we're really trying to tailor treatment better towards aphasia type, aphasia severity, et cetera, to maximize outcome in, in rehabilitation. Uh, CSTAR is a collaborative effort. Um, most of the work happens here in South Carolina. My collaborators here are Dirk Denouten, Chris Rorton, Ruthvik Desai, and Leo Bonilla, who is at MUSC, so Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. But our other collaborators are R.G. Hillis, who is at Johns Hopkins, and Greg Hickok, who is at UC Irvine. Um, the one thing that I want to mention before I uh, um, uh, give the podium to our speaker is that our research relies very heavily on participation of people with aphasia. Um, so that what we do is treatment research and we really do a lot to recruit people from the community to get involved in that research. The nice thing about it is that it's free of charge. We also provide uh, money for transportation for participants. So for the speech language pathologists that are in the crowd or online, which is a, a hefty number as well, if you have patients who have maxed out on the number of hours that uh, they have for rehabilitation or you just feel like they have plateaued in your treatment, I would ask you to look towards us as a viable option for them to get rehabilitation. Um, before uh, I go further, I want to mention that our next lecture is going to be uh, uh, April 13th. That is next week on Thursday. And that's going to be Bonnie Braining, who is a postdoctoral fellow with R.G. Hillis at Johns Hopkins University. Now, um, for today's CSTAR lecture, we have a real treat. With us is Tom uh, Brazard, Dr. Tom Brazard. He's a stroke survivor, and he'll be speaking to us about stroke from a very different perspective than what we usually hear about in our typical C-STAR lectures. Prior to his stroke, Dr. Broussard was an associate dean at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University. Uh, before that, he, he was the owner of Career Prospects Incorporated, a staffing and career counseling company for 15 years. Uh, today, Dr. Broussard is a uh, stroke educator we're very fortunate to have the opportunity to hear his uh, very unique perspective this afternoon. Welcome, Dr. Broussard. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, let's see. Hit it once. Oh, there it is. It's nice to meet you all. How are you? Good, good. Um, I do appreciate being here for sure, Julia, for having us here, having me here. Um, my name is Tom Broussard. I did have a stroke. Um, this is going to be a story like all these other stories you have had before, right? Everybody here either works with or is a stroke survivor themselves. Everybody has a story. So really there's nothing more nor less than what I have to do here is share my story with as many people as possible. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about. If you have questions as we go through it, you can have questions, you can save them, we'll work on that to the end for sure. Um, and if it's possible, so I can't see anybody on that side, can you pull all those those uh, blinds down? Just um, because it's difficult to see. Are you a man or a woman? Okay, most of you are, yes. <laughs> but beyond that, yeah, all, all three of them coming down. Thank you. <laughs> all right, you see those disclosure st statements? Um, I actually put this slide up because I was at the Stroke uh, Young Stroke Conference in uh, Jacksonville in December last year, and it's always my habit with a stroke to remember things, right? You have to constantly remember things and to practice doing what you have to do. So when I go to conferences, I typically, not typically, I always write down everything I'm doing. So you can see that Dr. Sen was a 19th presentation in two days. And I was writing those notes there. 
and I also record a little bit of information about what kind of a speaker that he or she is, just so that I can better understand how they're relating to their audience uh, at a time when I couldn't speak at all. Then there was a time when I used to do public speaking and didn't do well with you after my stroke. So this is all part of that. So I happened to write that down, among other things, that Dr. Sen um, had, was using lots of humor at his presentation. I wrote that down. And then about a week later, I got the call saying, hey, you want to come up here and speak? I said, oh, geez, now I just have to work on this humor stuff. Um, but he, he was very good. He was very good at what he had done. It was a lot of fun. Um, this is my agenda, and we're just going to talk about it. Obviously, going to talk about my stroke as the story, and then more of the steps going forward uh, in terms of what I had done. It's been uh, almost six years since my stroke when I couldn't read, write, or speak well. Um, and this is really, it starts, this is uh, Main Street in Waltham, Massachusetts. I literally took this picture on Main Street. I've been up there now several times in Boston taking pictures, uh, recording things, uh, taking distances and such. And I actually fell down on that uh, street, um, actually crawled to the yellow sign there, to the, the pole, and then crawled to the white one. My wife was walking with me. And she was ahead of me, so she didn't even look back. She was, we're all talking. And she looks back and sees me crawling and comes right back and says, are you having a stroke? But at that point, that was it. I, was, I did not know what was happening at that point. Um, but this is really the beginning of it all. Now you're looking at that pole. Whoops, sorry, go back. So you see that pole, looking at it from that perspective. Now we're going to look at that pole, the other perspective. Um, this is where I was holding on when my wife grabbed me. And she dragged me um, 310 feet to CVS and to the pharmacy in the back. Um, she's a very short person. I'm relatively tall. Yes, Leslie, I see you laughing over there when I said short. Somebody who's shorter says that. Um, my wife is like you. And she dragged me. Of course, I asked her all the time. I said, did you really drag me? She says, no, you were just off somewhere else. And I just pulled and pushed. and and made me get there. Uh, but that's how it all worked for me anyway. Um, she actually put me in, in those chairs exactly and uh, asked them to call 911, and, which they did. Turns out there was a station like half a block away. Uh, I was sitting there in the chair. Um, and actually, at the very beginning, when I was actually having the experience of the stroke, I, I went from being, I call it being asleep. So I went from being awake to asleep. When I looked at my feet out on the street, and that was the last I knew. I just looked at them. I knew I couldn't move them. I just looked at them. And that was the end of it. Um, and I didn't know anything until she put me in these chairs. And I sat there. And I woke up again. So I'll, I'll continue to use that uh, phrase. And I looked up and saw this crowd <laughs> around me. And I thought, huh, um, this is interesting. There's a crowd here. I must be part of that crowd. I don't know what they're doing. But whatever they're doing, I want to be with them. Uh, I had no idea. And of course, I couldn't even articulate it for you, of course. But on the inside, when I woke up, I knew that something was going on, but it had nothing to do with me. Um, but the, the EMTs came to get me. And uh, there were two that came in. And I fell asleep again. I woke up in the gurney. So there was uh, one EMT on my right, one on my left, the one on my left, sorry, left. Um, and I could see him. He was talking to me, put in a saline drip. Not that I knew anything about that at the time, um, and was comforting me. And I thought, isn't that nice? He's comforting me. I don't know why. He must like me for some reason. I have no idea. Um, and but the guy on my right was there working, and he uh, he was uh, speaking. I couldn't see him, but I thought he was just right there. But I could feel his talking on my hair. I mean, he boom boom. He was talking, and I could feel it. Um, I didn't think anything about it until he reached across to strap me in. And when he did that, his hand appeared. And literally, it appeared. Just that. Sliced off here. There was no body. He was doing his thing, sort of like it. He's doing his thing, and it goes away. <laughs> yeah, I know. Just like it. He did it again. And he was doing some more thing, and it went away. Now, I, I always like to say, but it's probably true, my little brain got a little bit bigger, right? And I said, huh. I don't know. Something must be wrong because I could see those, those the hand and it went away. One second later, his head went across, <laughs> had a beard. He looked like a balloon on a stick 
on a on a on a spring, and that was it. Boom, 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 right in front of me, nobody. He was just sliced. He was doing some stuff like this. I looked at him, looked at him. Boom, he went away. And at that point, I said, "Huh, something's going on here, right?" Again, this is me on the inside. How how would you know anything? But that was me at least uh, being shocked enough to actually wake up. Waking up, it's what we call what many people call a flash bulb um, picture. And so it was that kind of a shock that I woke up and saw that happening. So that was the beginning of it, really. As I filed that in my mind, I couldn't tell anybody until I could tell my wife about it later. Um, but uh, she understood some of the things that she could tell from the evidence of me on the, on the inside, such that when I was at those chairs, because I was part of this crowd, I was, I was grooming myself. You can imagine if you have patients grooming yourself like this, like this, just doing this, just doing this. I didn't know why. She could tell I was grooming her myself, and I kept doing this. But doing this, you know, of course, I couldn't use this hand or my leg, but I was still trying to uh, arrange myself, as it were. Uh, that was really the beginning, but at least I could tell that that was happening on the inside and remembered it. She also remembered it later, that she could tell, oh, that's what you were doing. Okay, that's what it appeared to what you were doing, and I could agree with her that that's what I was doing. Um, so at that point, I realized that there was an invisible cloak in front of me, and in fact, I couldn't see from the right side either. So that was the beginning of that. Um, they uh, put me into the ambulance, and I uh, went to sleep again, <laughs> as you can only imagine. I woke up somewhere in the ER, um, and I actually woke up because they gave me uh, TPA. And the, uh, I had my stroke at about 8.30 in the evening. We were out walking. We always walk a certain way, about three miles every, every year, every day. And um, the, uh, it was 8.30. We sort of figured that out not among things because I actually, my last email that I got from work was at 7.45 that we found all this work going forward. And then Laura said, let's go, ready, okay, up, out, walking, boom, 9.30, 8.30. Now, you've already heard me say some numbers that are wrong, right? Anybody noticing that? Okay. So, so of course, I still have aphasia. I work very hard. Now, you're hearing some things uh, that you'll almost always hear that's wrong. I like to find those things that are wrong. So every time I can, as soon as I can start to be aware, I can say, okay, I missed that, I missed that. Now I'm telling you, okay, I'm missing those things. You can uh, watch me or actually I can tell from your eyes when you can actually tell that I've made a mistake or not. And you're not, you're typically not going to say, oh, Tom, it was wrong. You're not going to do that. But you can certainly use your eyes so I can tell that I made that wrong thing because you need to know this. You need to know this all the time, not just once a day or once a week all the time, because that's the way our brain works. Um, so where was I talking about? Where was I doing? Ah, walking, 8.30. I got the TPA at about 10.30 in the evening. I uh, had been asleep since the uh, pharmacy, woke up when they gave me TPA, and the next thing, I woke up again for the first time when they gave me the TPA and immediately started feeling this tremendous amount of popcorn popping in my brain. I heard it. It's just like Drano, right? In a, in a, in a clogged pipe in your kitchen. You use the same kind of stuff. You're making these bubbles. They explode. They take a little bit of matter around with them, right? I don't know how it really works, but it seems to work for me because they gave it to me and immediately could feel this popcorn popping in my head, and it was loud. So I started doing this. Really, actually, they wanted to restrain me because I was going <laughs> like this because it was right here, and I started talking using word salad, you know, I made no sense, not even real words, just making a lot of noise. Um, but there were only two people in the room, my wife and the nurse. So I'll say months later, really longer than that, a year later, when longer, when I finally went to my uh, hospital and then to my rehab hospital and got all the notes, all the possible information they had, found, finding that note from the nurse that said, infusing TPA patient talking or saying something, I, it's in my book, um, word salad. Well, I had told my wife months later that I then could explain to her, this is what was happening. And literally she said, oh, that's what you were doing. We had no idea. We just saw you doing this all the time. And I was spewing, really. They had no idea. 
on the inside, I was saying, oh my God, you guys should have one of these things. It is just going like crazy. It actually was quite painful because it was making so much noise. So that was the next step of remembering. If you would like to think about a person with aphasia who has a difficult time remembering things um, and being aware of things, this was really the beginning of understanding that I was A, understanding, more aware, and becoming more aware of what was actually happening to me. But these are the four or five um, um, flashball memories that I remembered and held on to. Because at that point, I really began to realize there was something else wrong, other than the fact that I'm just a nice guy and they brought me here for no good reason. I had no idea. Um, the, um, and one last thing here is this picture here, I actually took five photographs at the hospital using my uh, iPhone. This is one of them. I was completely unaware. I had no idea where I was, but they had told me I was leaving the ICU. That was on Wednesday. I had my stroke on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I didn't wake up in a way that I could express to anyone else until Thursday morning. So on Wednesday, I had uh, an SLP who had an assessment, told me all kinds of things. I sat there going, yeah, sure. <laughs> I had no idea. And in fact, because they told me I was leaving, I actually took this photograph. Didn't even know that until the following year because I really didn't even know. I took five pictures at this hospital two, two weeks later and then started to get better at understanding this and started taking more pictures. But it took me a year before I could see them, saw their date stamp and said, wow, I took that at the hospital. And here's the exact time. And 15 minutes later, I took another picture and that was in my new room. And again, unaware although your body will do an awful lot of good things for yourself based on its habit, based on its ability to do these things. So it's pretty amazing. Um, the, uh, this happens to be the third one. This happens to be when I was in my new room on the seventh floor and when I began to realize that even though I could walk all over the floor, um, uh, I just wanted to, go, wanted to know why I, I couldn't go home. And I kept asking all the time, and they said, uh, eventually, eventually, eventually. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, while I was asleep, Thursday, Friday, finally went home on Saturday. But nobody, I'll say nobody had told me about all this stuff, but of course they did tell me. My SLP did do that assessment, actually gave me paperwork that said aphasia, uh, lost your language, uh, word finding, all these kinds of things. I, again, had no idea that I even met her, never mind understood that all this had happened. Um, so I was on my own uh, and I started to explain to myself why was something wrong, something was wrong with me, I wanted to know why. And I went around the floor, I would look into every open door and I saw patients and I could see. I kept looking at myself, I'd fluff my legs and say, I think I'm okay, why can't I go home? And I could see other people who were clearly uh, uh, damaged in one way or another. And I started to think there must be something wrong with my head, with my brain, and still had no idea what was going on, even though I've been, quote, told these things already. But I did take this picture because those are some of the things that I was beginning to realize that uh, I could not find the way in me to say those words. I thought, huh, maybe, there's, maybe that's it. Maybe that's what's going on. Um, and these are some of those bits of memory that we talked about, and I think you've seen all of them here. Yeah, so that was it. And that's all I remembered basically for those first three days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, and woke up on Thursday thinking that that was the day after that I had what otherwise I've been told was a stroke. Um, the, now, I've, I've said already that I couldn't read, write, or speak well, but there's a lot of my work now is really my habit then. I was a naval engineer, I was a US naval officer, I was a, a US submarine officer at sea. I know how to do things right. You have to work very hard to make sure that you pay attention to everything. So that was my habit. It really is my habit. So my habit was to continue, as it turned out, to keep track. I didn't know who I was, what I was doing. Why don't I just sort of keep track of what's going on? And it started by keeping a diary. Now you know I can't read, right, or write. So I kept the diary, as it turns out, using for the first two months with metaphorical drawings. 
everything you see there, I, obviously a lot of math is involved with that, a lot of numeracy was involved with, with that, and they were all metaphorical drawings. So you can see a lot of information there that helps you understand that I understood that when I was saying things, I couldn't say those things out loud, although when I wrote them, I thought they looked just fine, but when I wrote them, I also used these drawings because it was my habit. I was director of mechanical engineering and design at Bath Ironworks, which is a big shipbuilder in Bath, Maine. So that's what I, we used to do all the time. So I started writing about what we were thinking using these drawings. And it turns out that that's what I was trying to write. I ended up doing what turned out to be a 500 page diary using the diaries, the, 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 fig, the figures that you see there, plus all of the, the uh, words, all of which were spelled properly, you'll see some others, that were spelled properly, but they make no sense at all to you. Um, but when I wrote that in particular as a good example, I was saying to myself, each of those cards, were, these are railroad cards, each of them were a word. And I could tell that the coupling between them was gone. I didn't know why, but I pointed them. That's why I said that and said those couplings are gone. Now I wrote what I also wrote, probably trying to say exactly that, and you see what it says here. It makes no sense. So again, if you were an SLP, if I had given that to you, you would have said, oh, okay, Tom seems to be thinking like this. Oftentimes you look at us and you say, I wonder what he's thinking. Well, that was me thinking. That was how it worked for me. Um, the, uh, but when I started the diary, that is the first entry that you see there. You see that every word there is spelled properly. Believe it or not, uh, I, in my mind, I wrote it, thought everything I was writing looked just fine. I could even see that that first word was misspelled, and I fixed it, right? Calendar, fixed it. It still makes no sense as you look at that, and that was my first entry, and that's the way it went for quite a while, as you will see as we go forward. Um, you see the first slide there, the first entry is that's the date. Um, the next slide, so that is my, my stroke was in September. I had the first entry in October and then went on and did my work with both an SLP plus a group at the uh, Boston University Aphasia Resource Center in Boston. Um, and the last day before we had to leave, because I'd lost my job, and we had to sell our place up in Maine. We had an apartment there in Boston, and we had bought a place in Florida. Um, we had to leave, and that was my last day there, April 30th. And you can see there, if you're up close, or again, if you look at the uh, books, you'll see what they look like. I was starting to make more language, more like a telegraphic type of language, but you can see it degrades at the bottom. It degrades at the bottom. Um, so that was the beginning of me beginning to understand that, although it all looked fine to me on the inside. And then six weeks later, you can see that from here, I had uh, uh, applied as a volunteer at the local hospital, and I'm still a volunteer there, you know, five years later. Um, and you can see what's working. Grammar was there, there wasn't anything misspelled, and that was the first time. You can look at the dates. So you can tell right there is eight months of transition from somebody who is unaware and unable to write and had no grammar to someone who did. Now I had some other uh, activities that I had entertained myself with so that I could give the appearance of looking like I was writing, but all of it looked fine to me anyway. And the fact of the matter was that it wasn't until August 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, actually six weeks later, that I woke up another another epiphany, I woke up at a library while I was walking, when I was writing, and had another click, and I thought, wow, something, something else has happened. I've been writing and reading my diary along the way, and I went back and looked at them again, like I was always doing, but they all looked fine. I looked at it for the first time at that library, because I have pictures of the things I had written, and I looked at that, pointed at that uh, first entry and said, who wrote that? Who wrote that? I looked at it and said, I know that that's my handwriting, but I don't know who wrote that because I've been writing just fine all this time and looking what I just wrote today, meaning today in August, I've been writing 
fine for six weeks, starting right there. And I went forward thinking that everything I had done from October one year to August the next year was all fine. But for the first, at that very moment of becoming more aware, which is really at that moment, I immediately started writing and said, if I don't write this down as fast as I can, I will forget it in an hour. And I told myself, now you, uh, in my book and in my uh, diary, this happened to me and now I can see I had new eyes looking back at what had happened before, understanding that I'm now going forward with these new eyes. And I said all that as fast as I could. That was, what, did, what do you call that? Instantaneously, right? I was able to perceive within seconds that something had happened. And to me, I, even to me to, today, I'm the guy and I go, wow, that is amazing. Your brain is so good when it can be any number of ways damaged that it can still tell you, encourage you, show you how you can get better. And to me, even me on the inside, I thought, this is, this is all pretty good. This is actually pretty good. Anyway, so that's the way it works. Ha, I know, I know. I, 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 with my family and friends, and I'll call all of you friends, because when I work around the country, uh, all of us are friends. You know, you're, you're an SLP uh, or a person with aphasia, and you, you shake hands the first time, and it's hugging all the way from there. So we are all friends, right, when you really think about this. And I often say to myself, as if I was somebody else, I go, this is great. We all need to tell these stories, right, because we all have our own very unique stories. And uh, so many of the stories I've listened to from others, I can continue to go, oh, my God, right? A friend of mine was mute for seven years. She now works speaks, married, two kids, mute for seven years. So people ask me, can, well, you're going to get better after a couple of years, whatever, and to myself, and then I tell everybody, I said, well, I don't know about anybody else, but my friend <laughs> was mute for seven years. And look at her. She talks like crazy. So you think about that. Think about how the brain allows us to proceed. It's really pretty amazing. Anyway, um, the road to recovery here, obviously we have conventional speech. I talk about that here, speech therapy, as our SLP. Uh, I had 30 sessions, which for me, that was the best I could do with my insurance, right? 30 sessions. Other people get eight or 12 or 16. I got 30, uh, uh, 30 minutes each. So that is 15 hours. And then I went to the group, so I figured out another 20, 30 hours, so about 50 hours for conventional. Um, Intensive, I wanted to do that. Um, uh, got in touch with uh, uh, RIC in Chicago. You know how much that costs, right? And this is five years ago or whenever when I asked, it's pretty much the same. 25,000 bucks plus your hotel. I said, okay, can't do that. But I did go to their website and said, huh, this looks like what they're doing is what I do. I'm just gonna keep on doing this, right? I, I sure don't have the money. So I was intensive in my own way. And now I talk about myself as what I call enriched. Basically, I just worked every day uh, and I did it for a long time without really knowing what I was doing. I wasn't aware that I would get better or worse. I just kept doing what had to be, quote, done uh, with reading, writing, speaking, and doing a lot of work. And that turned out to be, as it turns out, not only enriched, not only novel, but it turned out also that after doing all this work, at a certain point, which in my case was uh, August 1st, 2nd and 3rd um, of that year, almost it was 11 months, I became more aware. And upon becoming more aware, then I was to go back and look at the evidence of 11 months of work. That if I hadn't have done that, this wouldn't have happened. I wouldn't have hundreds of pages of my diary. I wouldn't have, using my iPhone, I recorded myself every day. And you're gonna say, well, how come you did that? I don't know. It just seemed like the thing to do, right? If you can't do anything, you're only with your therapist for uh, an hour a week, what are you going to do the rest of your life? And I thought, okay, well, I guess I should just sort of study. Not that I said it that way, but I figured I'll just start recording myself, just like I used to do, as it were. Not really knowing that I was recording myself, knowing it was all damaged, and being unaware that it was all damaged until some day would come when I could see with new eyes. And all that happened. And again, now I come back to saying, how do you like that? Um, 
the enriched environment, it just happens to be the way I defined it, uh, and you see that, that uh, definition right there, but I certainly was using a lot of uh, articles and, uh, about mice, because they do talk a lot about enriched in environments, and humans do too, but it's really easy to look at the mice and go, oh, okay, we can tell the difference between a mouse who is unenriched, as it were, uh, in a standard cage, or somebody who is enriched. And what does all that mean? Well, they give them lots of toys, right? A new, a new crib, a new place, lots of, lots of color, lots of all kinds of stuff. And as a result of that, and without really knowing how it works for me as a human, never mind the mice, basically, as a result of doing those things, their brain, brains grow. And we know that from looking at those, those uh, cells. And given the fact that I had my 100 billion cells, I lost, they always say, doctors always say, oh, you lost about 2% when you have a stroke. Well, that's 2 billion cells. Gone. And they're never going to come back. Now, there are other ways that you can grow some new cells, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about right here, right now. You're never going to grow me some new cells, inject them into me and say, okay, remember themselves all over what you had before. It doesn't work like that. But I now... And better, better enough to talk about it here. And now you're realizing, again, you already know this, but I didn't know this. Again, engineer. I didn't know this stuff. Here is our, our cells who then grow in different ways, developing those new connectivity. That is what is actually where the damage is. I didn't really know that it was really the cells is one thing, uh, but it's really the connectivity between where they were all coming from and going to. And they couldn't grow them again, and they did, as, as we have seen here, um, whether it's a mouse or a man. Um, and in a similar way here, just another really uh, slide explaining uh, the difference between something on the left, which is something that you as a student or an employee are bored, frustrated. You know how it works. You can't imagine that somehow your brain grows better based on those conditions. Yet the ones on the right, when you are excited, and you obviously we didn't talk about the exercise, that's important too, but you get this all additional feedback, you feel better, you get better. So it really sort of works the same way. It doesn't sort of, that's the way it works. Um, in my particular case, the I started with my, my SLP and the group and continued to do what turns out to be the, the, my own prescription uh, exercising for sure. Um, I was walking a lot anyway, um, but really didn't realize that by walking, I would immediately be triggered into saying something about what was happening in my brain because it made me think. And no SLP is ever going to say to a patient, oh, you should go home and think. It doesn't work like that. Um, and nobody did say to do that, but as I started walking, I started to think a lot more about what was happening. Now, people then will often say, well, geez, Tom, what else happened before the stroke? Why did you get your stroke in the first place? Well, in my particular case, I had heart surgery three months before my stroke. And that is probably why I had the stroke. Um, the, uh, they couldn't come up with any really good reasons for why I had the stroke, but they probably figured it out, something to do with that, uh, because their protocol from uh, major surgery like that is six months before you get TPA. And I was at three months, and they actually had to debate and said, okay, we're going to give it to them anyway. Um, so that's probably what was happening. Uh, so I was already walking because I was already having heart surgery done, and now just went on to continue to walk as long as I wouldn't get lost. Um, and with that really became the precursor to thinking hard about what was going on uh, in my brain. The 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 evidence, the, what did I say? Okay, so I forget some words. I don't forget some words. I just can't pronounce them. The, the um, evidence, say that word for me again. Evidence. Say it again. Evidence. 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 <laughs> I'm going to say the curse words, but it's on tape, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> evidence. Evidence. Uh, I encourage you to tell me when I make the things wrong all the time. Because uh, it helps me, but it's very interesting that today is my day for uh, not being able to pronounce evidence perfectly. Um, but I had my diary. I recorded myself with, with my, my iPhone. I took pictures with my iPhone, right? And I got all of this different, different um, 
portals into how I could better understand what the world was showing to me using that way. So that evidence was very important. Uh, the next step was the feedback. You, before you can have feedback, you need some amount of evidence, right? If you can't write that's good or bad, then you don't have anything to, to, to measure it to. Um, now, in my case, I was writing poorly for a long, long time. I didn't know that they were bad, but that doesn't mean that on the inside, I wasn't still already building new synapses that one day would allow it to right, rise up enough to be able to then speak and do things better. You, can't, you don't go from here with, with having lost them all and at some point in the future all of a sudden become more aware. It just doesn't happen like that. It grows and grows and grows. There is a critical mass uh, before you can move across and now go across that threshold and be able to speak properly, be able to see more aware of what was happening. So I didn't know that at the time, but it turned out that I was doing all this, improving myself, still being unaware that I was improving. Right, so that that all worked, and I needed that feedback because still I saw the you saw that word that was misspelled. That's feedback, right? I wrote it; it was wrong. I fixed it. I had no idea, but that is still the kind of feedback you need all the time on a regular basis. I do get I did get feedback from my SLP, but I usually would get a reported uh, two or three pages, two or three weeks later. And I would read them, and I still wasn't in control enough of the kind of feedback that I needed, not that I, not that I knew that I needed them then. I just happened to have done it then and eventually became aware enough in the future and looked back at a past that would not have been if I hadn't have done that. Think about it that way. If you are aware, unaware, and you have a stroke, and let's say you go weeks, months, years without knowing anything, Maybe in the future, maybe you will or you won't begin to remember a little bit more of the past. Maybe that was remembering now. I remember it a week ago. What about a, week, a year ago, more years ago? If you're able to do anything to create the evidence, almost like in, like the, the, uh, in a cave for, for the, the, um, the old days when they would write on the wall and then they would sit on that wall in the cave for thousands of years, millions of years, until some other human, same kind of human, just better, finally crawls in there, sees them and goes, aha, uh -huh, that was me in the old days. Now I'm me now in the new days, but now you can understand so much more about that. So the feedback is important. Uh, problem solvings and metaphors, uh, every one of these slides could take uh, an hour. Uh, we won't do that, uh, but you'll see in my books a lot of metaphors that contributed to my understanding now based on my metaphors of what I knew then. Because when it comes to physics and math and engineering, there's a lot of things that you have to always explain to yourself using metaphors. So I thought about that all the time, and then somebody basically showed me something new to look at, right? A new problem. You take the same grid, and you put that on top of it and go, oh, this helped a lot. So I know on the inside it helped a lot. Now it helps me a little bit. Socialization, absolutely, and uh, the interaction and the active learning. Uh, because I really didn't know just how important this would be to not just look at reading or writing or speaking, but to look at all of them all the time with some of these subroutines that go further into just dealing with those three modalities. Uh, so that was very important for me because I was able to discover more subroutines of deficits that for the most part, the, the SLP won't tell you, really, because you won't, you're really dealing with the bigger things, working through them, not getting down to something like um, rise time or other things that are just not something you're going to work on first. I found those kinds of things out going forward, and I think it was because of the interaction of all of them. Um, what I should do here, though, is, of course, all of that work, I'll say it was 11 months, but it took longer because I kept on doing it, for another couple of years, another year after that. But I had my SLP and all the other things we've talked about. So now if we were to basically erase, erase everything that had happened to me, so there was no feedback, there was no evidence, there be no exercise and thinking, I would have had this. I would have had, and I'm sure been a good person working with my SLP, but I think then we all want to say, huh, 
what, what would probably be the difference in terms of the outcome if this one person clone gets this and another person clone gets that? What are they both going to look like a year from now? And I would say that I would not be who I am if I had not have indulged myself really doing a lot of work. Again, a lot of it I was unaware with at the time, but did it at the time without knowing. And I think that's important because then in that, the SLP world then can be better informed to know that no matter what you think is happening between you and your patients, you know what you know. You're not sure you know what they think, even if you think they know what they know. You have to continue to do things that can can be a, a good, um, I have another metaphor, but I won't do it now, but it helps a lot. It's a good trigger to help people continue to do things, even if they're unaware, still have them do it, knowing that they may come a long time from now to look back and go, that helps a lot of what I was doing, meaning me on the inside. And this is what I describe, describe as the enriched environment. Um, and I won't read it for you, but you can see it there. I think that that is what it was, that that is what happened for me, absolutely. Um, and certainly motivation and practice was a large part of it for, for, for sure. But I think that, that it is this imperative that the brain actually does goes out and does these things, even if it's unaware. That's, that's sort of the, the thing I would think I hadn't thought of before. If you're aware, then you would tell me, Tom, go do these things. And I would go, okay, I'm going to go do that. Now realizing we're still you and me. I'm Tom. I'm unaware. Tell me to do it. I still won't do it. Now you have to help them. Start doing it now. Why? Because you'll get better later with, without even knowing that you're getting better because it's still below that threshold. Oh, yeah. Plasticity. Plasticity. Everybody here knows all about William James, right? I see, I'm looking at the eyes. <laughs> yeah. Everybody should. I always say this. I always say this. Why? Again, I always say, because I'm an, engin an, an engineer. I don't know anything about William James, right? But, of course, William James is the guy who first coined the term plasticity in 1890. And you would think, wait a minute. We're, we talk about plasticity today as a very important capacity to do what we do. We hear about it all the time, realizing that there's this guy way back then. Uh, so uh, it is a huge book, although literally it is huge. It's 1,200 pages, two volumes, and I've, I've read all of volume one. So that's 600 pages. It's going to take another two years to get through the next ones. But uh, the first volume is the best because it is, it is full of plasticity. So you get to really understand how he was thinking, and then me, because I'm on the inside thinking about what was happening, this of course came later, I began to use a lot of metaphors that allowed me to see things that he otherwise could see himself. This is him back in the 1890s. So it's very interesting. Um, and this is just another good slide uh, with the same thing about the difference between employment, uh, impairment and improvement based on the plasticity, which is really, plasticity is only one thing. It's not like you can insist that somebody um, do one thing or another to improve this kind of plasticity or another. It doesn't work that way either. It's all about um, uh, experience-dependent activity, and they induce plasticity. So it isn't, it isn't, plasticity is the thing. It really isn't the thing. It is all about experience-dependent activity that induce Plasticity. So like those mouse, they were either all by themselves, they felt a little lonely, they didn't grow as much. If they were having a lot of fun, more uh, uh, socialized, uh, lots of color, new things to do, they got better in terms of their neuro health. And that's how that works. Amazing. But plasticity is all about the doing. The doing come first, uh, comes first, inducing plasticity. Um, and most of this, a lot of this we've talked about, of course, uh, about experience-dependent plasticity inducing, experience-dependent activity inducing plasticity. Uh, the activities with varied modalities, we talked about that. The intensive activity, in my case, I figure I was working 40 hours a week. Um, that's not to say it was every day eight hours, because I think it was just everything I could, I'd do it, but then I'd sleep. Um, somebody had asked at my last presentation, how about sleeping? How about being tired? I said, oh, it's, it's, uh, there's a word for that. It's awful uh, with aphasia. You get so tired. 
it's not like in power through anything. It is get out of my way because I'm about to fall down and sleep. Uh, and I have been driving when sleeping while driving and sleeping. Hmm, not good. Um, so yes, <laughs> repetition activity. Again, some of these are pretty standard things. Uh, although it isn't so standard that repetition that I would say, okay, every day say the word evidence, 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 evidence. Um, that's one way of, of saying, okay, that's one way to build plasticity and repetition. But another way is to realize that evidence is run throughout this presentation and other things. And then we're having this conversation. I'm learning a lot more about my ability to pronounce the word evidence from listening to you, right? Because we had this inner activity going on here. So that helps a lot with that. Um, so repetition can exist in lots of different ways. Uh, personal relevance, um, we'll talk, well, through the books and everything else, but because of what I had done with my previous life, that helped a tremendous amount in terms of what I can now understand based on what I had helped to understand about the world before, using those same, almost exactly, metaphors. Um, the interaction between all of them as well, um, my, uh, my uh, SLP world was really focused on word finding and repetition. Uh, that was pretty much the way they referred to it. And in my mind, I was thinking, okay, that's part of it, but it seems like this is this interaction. There were days when I had work with my SLP, I would take some notes, she would give me homework, talk with her, I go home, go for a walk, record myself about the same uh, uh, topic, actually. Then I would write in my diary at home about the same topic. Well, now, I'll say a year later, many months later, a year later, when I found all of this evidence, then I put them all together in terms of their chronic timing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> timing. <laughs> then I found that there are certain days when I, for three different modalities, I had said and was addressing the same topic. Then I went and looked at them that way and said, oh, okay. Then I could say, this is what I thought I was saying. That's how it looked. This is what I was trying to speak. That's what it looked like. And then I actually spoke saying exactly the same thing in different ways. So then even I on the inside was saying, this is good. I should do this with all these different modalities in a way that would help me get, help me understand better about what it was. Keeping track is incredibly important. The feedback is what you need uh, if you, and you wouldn't have it if you didn't have um, the evidence. This is just a nice slide, but that's me working with my cells uh, growing because I didn't have the cells before. Um, I, I happen to like this as a metaphor about photosynthesis and plasticity um, because we all know what photosynthesis looks like. When you're a kid, you understand that it's almost magic. You don't understand it much unless you're a uh, scientist person. You just understand that with the sun, with uh, light, comes photosynthesis, everything turns green, it grows, right? It converts uh, light into matter, right? So I sort of understood it in that way, not much more than that, and then started thinking about experience-dependent activities and this thing called plasticity and said, huh, it sounds almost sort of similar, if not the same, metaphorically anyway, that with experience-dependent things, you get better with plasticity. So it was, again, like light and photosynthesis, and this is thought, as it were, experience-dependent activities and um, plasticity. So that's where this came from, and your, your brain continuing to grow. Every day is a session day, certainly, um, because most of my days in the beginning, every other day or two days a week was a session day until I began to realize as I was starting to do my work with reading, writing, speaking, I was starting to crowd out some of my other SLP work. And at that point, I began to say, huh, okay, every day is a session day. And the SLP people, they're doing what they're doing for me. I have to keep doing all this other stuff and continue to work uh, going forward. So everything is a session day. And to the degree that if, if I were to in, in, encourage SLPs that where their patience is to realize that every day is a session day, even if they're, they're too tired, they're not, that's all okay. Do one thing. Whatever the one thing might be, write your name, can't do that, write the date, can't do that, take a picture, okay, I can do that, because I have to do this. 
So anything is a, a session day, and you're providing this this um, this history so that you can explore it later in the future. I've talked about this a lot already uh, as you read through that. The um, I think that the long as I say the long term uh, tool is to start everything at the beginning. I always thought that maybe after I became more aware, then then they would tell me these things and I'd go forward and quote do those things. Well, a I wasn't aware until 11 months. Okay, well I ran out of insurance uh, early, not early but on time early. Um, so yeah, everybody knows about insurance and everybody knows it's going to end soon or worse. Um, so uh, yeah, so with the um, uh, starting on day one, even if you're not aware, to start creating your past. I think that's what it really comes to: is start creating your past, um, so you can investigate it at a future time when you're now more aware and able to study that. Um, awareness of deficits. Good one. Uh, talked about word signing. Okay, and the stimulating environment. So everything works there that I think we've talked about already. The, the experience is the key, as I talk about. The, uh, I always thought in the beginning that I would be, quote, was aware of my deficits. I've been told that with my SLP in reports, saying he's aware. But that was me on the, on the outside. On the inside, I'm going, I don't understand what this awareness of deficits means. And she kept saying that, and no, you're more aware. Okay, now I know. It's like, well, that's you saying that. What about me on the inside? I'm not aware of my deficits. And I didn't know that if I didn't have the, the, the feedback, and in fact didn't need the evidence, if you don't have the evidence, you won't have the feedback. You need the feedback to get awareness, not the other way around. So I continue to ask other people to say, even though at the very beginning you might be aware, because you're an SLP, you might be aware that you can tell the difference between the, your patients and to actually be able to tell that they appear to be more aware than, than, not, than not, still to understand that that may be only one facet of their ability to express themselves in a way that you can understand is more aware, but still not yet be at that point for that person. So you have to be careful of that and watching that going forward uh, until, well, until some other day happens in the future when that person who becomes more aware can then better express being more aware about that. That's a big deal. And I think the interaction is the, as I talk about it there, the ultimate active ingredient in, to, in terms of this uh, environment. Again, most, most of us are still unaware of how we can go about making that environment work. We have to sort of create that. But I think a large part of that is having that interaction between all these modalities and all the, the work that we do. OK, and as we know, we get better with therapy and more better, more work. That is the way it works. Oh uh, yeah, you can't see it, so easy. But if you need it, you can get on the, the uh, reference and that's it. So thank you very much. Questions? Questions from the room first, if you okay. want to monitor sure. your room. Sure. This was really excellent call to call. Thank you. Um, so it's very clear to me that what you have experienced is very extensive recovery. You've come a long way from where you started. But there's also a lot of people that started out with a very severe problem. And many, many years later, in spite of being extremely motivated and having tried hard, they have not made much gains. Do you have any recommendations for people that are in that? Or they tried a lot of things like you talk about, but haven't gotten better than more. Mm. Mm. Right. Tough. Tough, yeah. tough, tough. Yeah. Um, and having said that, of course, if there are people, so if, if you have patients and they've been working with you for a long, long time, and they're, quote, still not getting better, but they're still in at your facility, right? So you're explaining that they're still in your facility, then the 
I explain to other people with aphasia, and I do speak to a lot of people with aphasia, and understand that there is a, a, um, a new context of recovery uh, that is colloquial. We talk about being stroke survivors. Um, and that helps because it quickly we say stroke survivors, okay, cancer survivors. We understand those kinds of words. And we can say, okay, that works for me. Um, what, what it seems to work for me is to help people understand that all of us who have a stroke and aphasia and are in this room, that's really the thing. That person is in this room because unfortunately there are thousands of people in, that are never, never coming back. They're not in these rooms. We never get to see them again. If they're in this room, then they are stroke educators, not survivors. Because if they are here, then they are in a position to help explain to anybody else, because there's always new people coming in, if they at least agree uh, to be part of this process of staying, then they will get better. Now, that could take the rest of our lives you know, to get better. But more than that, by explaining in whatever parlance they've used before, and maybe it gets a little bit better, to other people coming in, then they can understand that it's much more important that all of us become stroke educators. Because we understand it from our perspective more than anybody else ever will. But they have to realign their, their conception of survivor, who is somebody who just you know, stays there, as opposed to an educator who helps themselves as well as others. But otherwise, your question is an answer that almost can't be explained, really. It's tough. But I did, I'll tell you one more thing I uh, mentioned before. I have a friend of mine, who's mute? Is that just not that? Okay. Yeah, I see. That's who I always use as my example. I go, wow, what can I tell you? They're never going to get better. Yeah. Bring her in. You know what I mean? So it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yes? You mentioned a lot of great ways that you gave yourself, like internal feedback, looking back at things that you have done. What are some of the most helpful um, external feedback systems that you had, friends or family or? What did you get from the outside that also helped you with feedback? Outside other than, than uh, the feedback that came from... Other than SLPs, you know, outside world, what was helpful from friends or family, and the, um, interactions like that. The most, I'll say most of my information came from the, 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 uh, the uh, diary, you know, the, the listening to myself, playing it back, listening to myself, uh, reading two books on the computer, I mean on the thing, and then listening to that. Of course, I can't tell you how bad they were, uh, so I had no idea that they were so bad until uh, they were transcribed a couple years later. So that was the kind of feedback I was getting from them, it was basically a uh, me telling me what's wrong with me type of thing. A lot of <coughs> cognition uh, about what was happening on the inside. So there were a couple of what I call observers on the inside. So they were the ones that were really telling me the most, Tom, this is wrong. Tom, this is not working. Tom, Tom, Tom. So right off the bat, you knew there were at least two people there. And then I knew there were three. And I figured out there were at least four. And I'm, like I say, I'm not a split, split personality, but that's the way uh, our brain works. So that's how it worked for me. My wife is at work, and that was the most important thing for us as a family. Uh, kids were all grown and gone, and number one thing in our family was, Laura's going to keep working. And she had to be really good at working hard, so she went back to work, and I was left alone for 11 months. So I didn't have, I had one friend, I don't have many friends, I had one friend, <laughs> and we always had breakfast, um, maybe once a week, and that was always fun. Um, but yes, most of it was me working with the tools. or first treatment session, um, designing therapy to make it personal. And sometimes as SLPs, we, we have these things ready for our patients or clients, but what advice would you give to SLPs in, in thinking about how to make things personal? So making it personal. Yeah, and asking um, for things that you wish were done or not done or in therapy. Okay, so I'm not sure if I got that question exactly right, but the, um, uh, the, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an answer. I'm not sure it's the right question. Um, so great SLP, right? Uh, we went to, 
to design, I guess she would have chosen to design my program going forward, right? I assume that's what you're talking about, mm -hmm. is what would you do? Um, the, of course, on the inside, I was, even if I appeared to be somebody who could actually understand what was happening, I really couldn't understand. So she probably said, Tom, we're going to work on this thing called word finding, because I have all the notes. I have everything that I got from her. Um, and we started on this thing called word finding. Um, on the inside, I go, eh, I don't know what this means. Um, so uh, I started figuring it out in terms of metaphors, but that took months and months and months going forward. So um, in terms of my SLP designing something that was more salient to me, uh, I don't think I ever remember being asked, and I'm not sure if I would have given a, an answer you would have found useful, but I don't think she would ask, what did you used to do? Well, you were, uh, I was a five-year dean. What did you used to do? I don't remember being asked, were you in the Navy? What did you do? Um, because that would have been 20 years of my experience. And um, it, it harbored lots and lots of metaphors, but I'm not sure if I was ever asked about any of that Maybe other than the fact that, oh, yes, you had a, you, you were at this school that's local. You know what I mean? So that could be part of it, is just to say, for the first, maybe even the first 30 minutes is, tell us about your life. Like we always do with our groups, right? We go in to have our groups, and we, we go there to do any number of things. We don't do anything. We talk about our, our stories. That's what we do. And then time's over. Ha! You know, food! Sure! So that's the way we work. And I think that's the way you work, too. That's what we work. Um, but that first day, uh, I think that I think you're really bent on making sure we're doing what's right for you going forward without either one of us really knowing what's right going forward. So I would say, first thing is, talk about your life. What did you do? Because an awful lot of my life goes all the way back to uh, early days. Early days. Yeah. So anyway, try that. Yes. I wonder if you can uh, talk a little bit more about the, the language of uh, thought. So you, you described that you in the beginning you were having these thoughts, you were hearing the popcorn, you were noticing things around you, but you weren't able to express that. To what extent do you feel that your, your thinking at that point was different and influenced by your language? So ask that again. So you think that the thinking is better or worse or what? Well, I'm asking whether you think uh, whether the the, 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 the the thinking process that you were having while you were lying there and noticing all this around right. you, to what extent can you look back on that and, and, and assess whether that was different in itself as well? So how was your thinking affected by the stroke? Okay. Maybe that's how I should okay. ask it, okay. rather than your language. Sure, sure, sure. So, um, good question. Um, the, the thinking component, so for the first three, four days, I had those um, tips that I had here where I saw things, the uh, photographical photographs that I had seen, I missed that word, um, and I could remember each of those memories. I didn't remember anything in between, so I was sort of asleep. When I started to wake up, I started to realize, and this is on Thursday, I could remember what was happening with physical things, because I would walk around the floor at this hospital, a hospital nothing like this, I could see everything that was happening to me. I could understand what was happening to me. I just couldn't, there were just a few things that I couldn't express. I couldn't see them or, or me saying them. Um, but at a certain point, in terms of thinking, I think that our thinking really works so darn well that at a certain point, maybe it took a little longer, that I began to realize that there was something wrong. It was with my language. I could see that I could not speak. All this time, this is the observer, watching all this happening so that I actually started to express, again, you see some of those drawings where I was trying to say to myself, there's something wrong and it looks like this. There are words that I can't say. But I can see that each of those words with, with couplings that are no longer there, I was thinking my way through all of this. So I actually, I actually had, now I'll think about thinking, I actually was thinking about the, um, uh, that I, again, not knowing anything about the brain, I actually thought that when you have a stroke and aphasia, that I thought that for a while there, that all of our words must be filed in 
file in files, right, in the brain, in cabinets. I just thought that, that was it. One cell, one word. I actually thought that. And actually, you'll see one of the one of the pictures up here. You see me actually thinking like that, not really knowing. I said, okay, well, I'm gonna think like that. One cell, one word. So I wrote a, a drawing that you see where I had X number of words. I said 50,000 words in my lexicon, and I lost, and I said 5,000 words. They must be gone. I actually thought that. On the inside, they must be gone. They're gone. I have to be, because there has to be some proportional ratio between cells and words. I wrote all that down. You've seen the pictures. I wrote all that down, went home that night, said, okay, that's what I think. The next day, I woke up. And I said, huh. And I spent all day walking, listening, and I found out, well, you know what? I can't find a single word that I can't see. I can't say it, but I can see it. And at that point, I said to myself, okay, throw away yesterday's thought thinking. Now here's a new thinking. Here's a new thinking. Here's a new thinking out there on the wood and not on the computer. Uh, and I said, I have no idea where this goes. Um, but, the, um, but the next day I said to myself, there are no words that are gone. I can see that some can be seen by me, but I can't say them, but none of them are gone. I realized that some of them were damaged in different ways, and I sort of rethought all of that and realized that the, uh, that the, the concept of building and filing words doesn't work like that. And it really is more of having this incredible uh, network of networks that work to allow somebody to speak, and it flows that way. Uh, and it comes right out of what I then ended up calling uh, parts of pieces. So the parts were the ones that were damaged, and they flowed into other pieces that became words, but they really all were damaged at the, at the uh, neurological, at the neuro basis where those little bits were damaged. But they obviously were also redundant because all the words that were wrong in all kinds of different modalities all had their own kind of damage, but none of them were gone. So that was another example of thinking. Yes, <laughs> So when you say we're actually seeing us <laughs> Any other questions? So, yes. So when you say you could see the words but you could speak it. Yes. That means the written language was there, which when you saw a pen or when you, you can you can write it down but you cannot speak. Is that what you mean? Um, uh, it's always a yes and a no. So when I could see it, I could see it here. I could not say it, and if I went to write it, I'm not sure what I would have written. If I spoke it, I would have said, instead of a pen, I could have said uh, uh, file cabinet. You know, it would have been wrong. I had lots of, of paraphasia working that I didn't know until it was transcribed a year or two later. Um, so, so no, I didn't, I didn't write it that way. I saw it up here, um, and that is actually, there's a much more larger metaphor about how I actually thought about it, that basically there was always a bridge being burned. I could see the words over there, it was always in over there. Think about the geography of your brain. You actually can relate to the geography of your brain. You can actually tell the difference between near and far. So far away, I could see those are the words. I could see them over there, but there was a bridge over the river. They were always burning to me. So I always looked at that and said, I can't get there, but what I can do is instead of, see, I want to start walking, and they said, don't do that, Tom. So if I started walking, I actually started walking metaphorically, physically, and physically, and I would always look back, right? So I would always see that word. I always knew it was in the distance. I would start walking and thinking. I would look back, and it always got closer. So I continued to do that over days, months, years, and eventually I would find that either A, I had built a new bridge, B, the bridge had reappeared itself, or C, the word so, came so close to me that I, I could now walk across the narrowness of that river. So that is the metaphor that was always running through me all the time, and I ended up 
Uh, in book three, you'll see a large chapter on uh, actually uh, the, basically the burning bridges, what happens. That's how I was thinking about it all the time. So I think it's all, I think the brain is a metaphorical genius organ, right? This is what it does. All of us use metaphors every single day. How do we use that? To better interpret what the world means to me. So it turns out, even on the inside, right, unable to say these things, I still have the metaphors, and I can still tell myself, uh, metacognition, telling myself, ah, oh, this is what's happening. So it's very interesting. Do you have another? Yes. In your lectures, or, or even in your everyday speech, uh, do you exhibit anomia in certain situations, uh, in certain uh, situations like this, in classes, in, in uh, everyday conversation with people? Uh, how often might you exhibit anomia or word finding difficulties? So the question is, how often are, are, are do, you, do you exhibit, do you realize when you exhibit word finding? Sure, sure. In the beginning, you know. lots of them, and I couldn't tell. I see a lot of things on the inside, um, but it was later that now I'm much more tuned, if you want to use that word, to realizing that there are what I call checking operations, so your brain works on what you're saying, what you're about to say, what you're now saying, and then what you're yeah, saying it, although it seems like it takes a short amount of time, well in neuro time, it takes a lot of time. So when you normally can say a word in uh, 200 milliseconds, or three, and then now you can't get to it, well, it's not going to take forever. It's going to take three, four, or five milliseconds, right? But by then, you sort of can't get to it, right? You can't get to it. So now I'm more aware that there's also a checking operation that says, okay, you started to default on evidence, evidence, as an example. But as soon as I start to say it, there's another checking right behind you that says, Tom, it's wrong. I see it coming even before it leaves your mouth. It's wrong. Now I'll end up saying it poorly. You've heard me say it a few times here. The checking looks at that and quickly tells you, well, that was the checking that was lost in the beginning. It's now coming back. Now I work on it a lot. Uh, so now I can usually tell if it's a crowd like this, I'll do it because it works for all of us. Uh, if I did it too many times, I'd be four. So we don't do it as much, but I watch it all the time. Basically, you have to continue to watch it all the time. So, but it's still every day. Every day. Shall we do an online show? Sure. Um, to what degree was your auditory comprehension compromised, or your understanding of what people were saying? And uh, did you feel supported uh, during uh, conversation, for example, by the SLP using written words or pictures while they were speaking to you? Then I'll say yes, very supportive on the SLP side. Um, the, on the SLP side, um, just remembering what people were saying to me, and can I actually hear what they're saying and then act on what they've said? Um, there were, and with the SLP and uh, a restaurant or with friends, I could, I could, on the one hand, I'll say I could understand what they wanted to say. I could say that. However, rise time, where where all of us or people with aphasia have a really difficult time. Um, Engaging with the first two or three words, and I didn't know that that was the issue. I thought I just couldn't hear. And my wife actually thought <laughs> lots of different things about not being able to hear. Like, aren't you aren't you listening to me? Uh, and that wasn't it either. I just didn't know. I know my wife's not here, although she'll see this eventually. Um, the, uh, that's why she doesn't come. <laughs> But that was, the, that was the issue because I thought I just couldn't hear. And it wasn't until I had created the, the, the understanding of what wise time actually meant, meant, meant for me. I actually wrote all this down, didn't use the word wise time. I wrote it myself. I figured it all out because I was sitting there listening to my wife and I could begin to tell that the first, because she started to talk and I would, 
run after her words and could always see that I was chasing two or three words. And then I would say, my wife, I call her Laura or Mom. I'd say, Mom, say that again. She'd go, okay, so say it again. Now I'm like that, right? You know what it is. I'm attending, so I'm listening. Okay, so now I understand what she was saying. I then I began to realize that that was a deficit. That wasn't a feature. That was a bug, right? So I figured all that out and started to realize as soon as Laura started, which was still too, too late, I would quickly turn off the TV, the radio, whatever, and quickly say, say that again? Please say that again? Because I couldn't quote remember it. Not realizing that me not remembering is different from me not attending to it in time given the attention deficit that I had inside of me. But I figured all that out. Yeah. So I was okay at listening. I still couldn't listen very well. This question was asked by Karis Hamilton from online. Thank you. Okay. Is she listening well? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you got nothing right here. I, did. I was just wondering, um, how much journaling do you do now, currently, and do you have a routine that you use for that? And also, how often like, do, you, um, do you go back and kind of look and, and self-reflect now on previous journaling, like you just from last month? Or Sure. Um, the, um, of course, my diary for my stroke, I saved that or I made that into uh, two and a half years, and then I blocked it to the, okay, that's it. And that has now been recorded and Xeroxed and the originals are put away. Now I have those and I use them all the time. All the time. I almost brought them with me to let you guys see what they look like. Because um, you see what 500 pages look like. Um, the uh, Today, so then when I stopped doing that, I started writing the first book. Now, that was interesting because I started writing the first book using the computer as if I was writing for the first book. And that took uh, two failed attempts with the first book. I, I just was awful. You know, I'd write them then, read them, redo them, and I could just tell from um, a uh, thinking, ordering everything properly, it still wasn't working. So I literally, I had to cancel those two and said, okay, I'm not going to do anything. So I started going back to just doing my study for another year, and then started writing again. Um, so I did not keep a diary for those periods of time. Um, now I write almost every day anyway for my books, so that is now my journaling. But it's not so much the same um, now. What I do now, um, because of Dragon software, which I didn't have before, uh, the, now when I'm writing about what you guys need to hear about my metaphorical stories, I basically close my eyes and turn on Dragon, so I'm talking, but remembering everything I could talk, I said before, or thought about before, and it goes right into Dragon and becomes a Word document. And then a lot of work after that, but that's how I record myself now. Yeah. Or if I'm walking out on the street, I'm using my phone still. Yeah. And there's one behind you. Can you recall any specific therapy tasks during your time with the speech therapist that you felt were useful and useless? <laughs> what did you like? What did you despise? <laughs> Everybody in the audience can hear that, that question? Yeah, I can't, even, I can't even imagine anything that I would not like. I can say that. Um, the social component, I think, of a person with aphasia, as you well know, are, uh, as we always say, we love our SLPs, right? You've heard that a million times. Why? Because you're, I'll say one of the few, you are, you are the few person, other than your family, who are interested in who you are and trying to do what you're doing. So they do everything and more what you can possibly do. Um, so there wasn't anything that <laughs> it couldn't, couldn't, it just wouldn't work, right? It's uh, something we would never do. I can't even imagine. Uh, what was good, uh, what was good was, for me, was I, uh, I had, I'd gone a couple of weeks when I, I needed something in print. And I got my homework, um, and I got all this other stuff, but I would do it and give it back to her, you know, I wouldn't get it back. After a couple weeks, I said, can I please have a copy of everything that you're doing? Everything I've done, everything you've done, um, everything. And uh, she said, okay. So I got everything back. I don't really have everything, but I got a lot of the 
first couple of weeks. And that helped me a lot. Even if I couldn't read it, I liked seeing something in front of me, you know, like this stuff, not even this, but the real thing. Um, and after another couple of weeks, when I said, can you give me some of your books? <laughs> and she said, no, nah, can't give you the books. So I did that for a couple of weeks, and she finally said, okay. I said, you know, I don't know if I can read them, but I like the titles, I like the table of contents, and to the degree I can get this far, I know I can get further. So she started giving me older copies of books and things, uh, and then I started buying more. Um, so I do like the physical book in my hand or things that are printed. Um, but metaphorically, which is to, in my case, just remembering when I was a kid, I wrote, I read a book a day in the summer, every day. So 100 books in that summer, every summer. And people would say, how do you do that? I said, well, I would read in one, one room, leave it there, go to another room, pick up the other book I'm reading, keep on reading that, put that down, go up here, read another one, have another one in bed, read that one, and every day I'd finish one of them. Right? Every day, every day. So I always did that. That was my habit. So I think that, again, was part of the habit. Now we're talking about William James and habit. I think that was it. Uh, I, I wanted things that I could read, even if I couldn't read them. And um, now I have lots of books about aphasia, and I still know nothing compared to what you guys know. Because I really don't, I have still a hard time using the words that you guys use. Um, word finding is one thing. Is enough. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh. I have a question. Lisa? Yes. Leslie. Leslie. Yeah. As someone, as someone who's had stroke, um, do you tell other people with aphasia, is there anything you tell them that helps to motivate them if they're depressed um, and don't have a lot of self-motivation? Hmm. Can you repeat that? Yeah, repeat the question. So, so what do we do with motivation with someone who's depressed who is not as motivated as you would like. That you tell them as a person who's, who has a patient. That I could help other people understand a little bit better, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, one of the best things I could do is to turn that around to all the SLPs and say, gosh darn, what do you guys do? Because I know that is probably one of the most difficult things to do. There's no pill for you or for me, really. Uh, part of the pill is, who were you in the past? I think that for me, helps a lot to know who I was in the past, and I'd like to explain who I was in the past. That's why I would like you to ask me on day one, who are you? Because you really, nobody knew who I was. And that's not like you're a good person or a bad person, just I don't know what else to do other than talk about myself. Um, and whenever I can talk about myself, then I'll say if, because I ask these questions of myself and I write them down, and you'll see them in books you already would have, you would see some of the motivational stories I had of my past that helped me understand what would help me in the future after my stroke. All of that helped, that was a loop, right? But if there is someone who is maybe not as motivated in one way or another, maybe one way would be to A, uh, start asking that question with them. What, is, what are you like? Who are you? What have you been doing? Basically looking for, not without you wouldn't have time to tell them, oh, this is a trick. It's not really a trick. If you're trying to figure out what they know so they can explain their past and begin to understand metaphorical understandings of what might be, be their future, you won't be able to do that. But you can say, talk about yourself. Tell me more about it. And then start to ask, how did you become that? Why did you become that? And I think part of that was me starting to think about my past using those metaphors and then thinking up here, okay, I cannot read, write, or speak. <laughs> All I've done in my whole life is read, write, or speak. There must be a way to be more engaged, be more uh, motivated, if I can remember some of those stories of what made me motivated about reading, writing, or speaking before in my own life, right? So that might help. Um, because for me, I mean, you know, I did a lot of stuff in my life when I was young. I thought I would go on forever, and as they say, live forever. Um, but the day after my 16th birthday, my dad died. And he looked just like me, tall, thin, heart attack, gone, just like this. 
And for me, that arranged my entire chronological life around understanding who my dad was for 16 years that I could understand, remembered them all, wrote it all down up here, and then going forward, started to take all of those stories and thinking, all right, what did he do for me that would allow me to get better, whatever that might be, whatever the, the good or bad might be. But it always had to do with the memory of a past that would, again, enable uh, to uh, allow a future to occur. So maybe doing some of those things. And actually, you'll see some some stories in book two that talk more about motivation uh, in that way. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you.